Hello, everyone. On behalf of Crossroads, I'd like to extend to you a warm welcome to the third annual Alba City Lecture on Faith and Culture. The lecture was established by Crossroads to honor the memory of Monsignor Lorenzo Albacetti, who chaired our advisory board until his passing. It's the highlight of our yearly program, and special thanks go to the Sheen Center for hosting it and to the Albacetti Forum for helping organize it. My name is Angelo Matera, and I'm a member of the Crossroads Advisory Board. I've also had the honor to know Monsignor Albacetti for many years. Monsignor Albacetti's intelligence and passion animated Crossroads from its start. He often reminded us that our mission and most important challenge was to reawaken in people an interest in the full spectrum of reality and also everything that's happening in our society today. In our 15 years, we've been trying to follow his advice because not to be interested in all of reality would mark not only our end as an authentic cultural center, but above all, the progressive decline of our humanity into nihilism. My own relationship with Monsignor Albacetti was sparked by these very same concerns. I had experienced a faith conversion in my mid-30s, thanks to the witness and thought of Pope John Paul II. I was about to launch a media project whose aim was to engage the most secular sectors of our culture when one of Monsignor Albacetti's former students, the speaker and author Christopher West said, you have to meet Lorenzo Albacetti. He's befriended many secular figures. He's, he has a column in the New York Times and no one understands the meaning of Pope John Paul II's theology like he does. And then Chris said something that got to the heart of what I was looking for at the time. Both the Pope and Monsignor Albacetti would rather you be free and wrong than unfree and right. And for a recent convert whose conversion was motivated to some extent by a rejection of the nihilism of secular culture, that was incredibly liberating and exciting to hear. I immediately arranged a meeting with Monsignor Albacetti, which took place in the offices of the movement of which he was the national chaplain, Communion Liberation, at Grand Central Station, the center of the city that is the center of the world. It was very appropriate. All I can say that I was never the same after those two hours with him. As evidence, I still have five pages of notes I scribbled furiously afterwards with all of his prof profound insights and hilarious quips. It was, it was for me as if faith and reality before that day had been in conflict, viewed through distorted lenses and were now in focus and in sync. I can't begin to fully explain what Lorenzo, as he insisted everyone call him, began to teach me that day. All I can say is that his wisdom and humor, his entire person, had for me the shock of the truly new as it has had for so many other people. That effect was perfectly captured by a remark Arthur Oak Sulzberger Jr., publisher of the New York Times, once made to Lorenzo when he said, we know a lot of priests, they tell us what we know, you tell us what we don't know. As extraordinary as his theological and spiritual insights were, so was his quick fire comic timing, as the people who knew him treasured. So I'll end with a favorite personal story. Once at a communion liberation event, a beginning day in Bryant Park, I was taking a cigarette break with Lorenzo, standing on the corner of 42nd Street and 6th Avenue, when a woman came up to us and asked, what is this, a protest? Yes, he answered with his mischievous smile. What are you protesting, she continued. Dualism, he answered, <laughs> without missing a beat. I'm sure there, there are hundreds, maybe thousands, of friends of his everywhere with stories like these. <laughs> In his humility, Monsignor Albacetti always cited the life-changing influence of his own mentor, Monsignor Luigi Giussani, founder of Communion Liberation. For both of them, and in the work of Crossroads, the word freedom has always had a central focus. Nowadays, it's often invoked from both the left and the right, but fewer and fewer people seem to understand experientially what makes it possible, what fosters it, and what instead could suffocate it. So it seems appropriate to return to basic questions. What is freedom? Where does it come from? Tonight, we're truly fortunate to have with us Professor David C. Schindler, 
who is doing groundbreaking work on this topic. As you can see in the program, Professor, Professor Schindler is Associate Professor of Metaphysics and Anthropology at the John Paul II Institute at the Catholic University of America, and the author of a new book, which we highly recommend, Freedom from Reality, the Diabolical Ca Character of Modern Liberty. Please help me welcome Professor Schindler to the stage. Thank you. It's, it really is a, a, a privilege to be here. Um, Monsignor Albacetti was a, was a dear professor of mine uh, as a, a, a master's student about 25 years ago. Um, I have a, a bunch of stories from that time, too. Most of them are not fit for public uh, <laughs> reporting. But what, once I can tell you one of them. I, I, I uh, was talking to him about um, the purpose of actions, and of course, he was chain smoking in the Dominican House, the smoke-free Dominican House of Studies in Washington. And I asked him, I said, Monsignor, why do you why do you smoke? And he looked at me and took a very deep drag of his cigarette and blew it straight into my face. And he said, I smoke because secondhand smoke kills people. <laughs> So it, it really is a joy to, to participate in a, a, a lecture series in his honor. My topic is uh, freedom, freedom from reality. <clears throat> the greatest revolutions are those that take place below the surface. The overthrow of a government is, of course, a dramatic and headline-making event. But unless it's accompanied by a new conception of man, the change it causes remains a superficial one. It's a little more than a new arrangement of the same old pieces. A change in our conception of man, that is in the way we understand ourselves, what it means to be human, the nature of human existence, is not just a particular revolutionary deed, but a revolution in the doer of every deed. Not just a new idea, but a new thinker of every idea. Not just a new value, a different value, but a different heart that receives and loves and pursues every value. Not just a transformed institution, but a transformation in the maker of every institution and in the one for whom every institution is made. A revolution in our conception of man, in short, changes everything. It causes a shift in the very horizon of our world. Now, if this is true, it follows that there are few things that are more important, both personally and culturally, than attending to the meanings of the central realities of human existence, those things that make us human, that distinguish us from other creatures, that present, as it were, the place wherein we encounter other people, ourselves, the world, God. So what is reason? What is love? What is freedom? The answer that we give to these most basic questions affects the way we understand and so relate to every, uh, everything, absolutely everything else. In a healthy culture, there may be little need to ask these questions in a deliberate or conscious way. Though, of course, such reflection on the meaning of human existence has always been a privileged activity, even when not imposed by need. But in a uh, culture in which, uh, quote, things fall apart, the center cannot hold, as the poet said, in which we witness the unraveling of the fabric of our humanity. Such reflection, I think, becomes an urgent necessity. So I'd like tonight to open up a reflection of this sort on the basic human reality of freedom, which I suggest has indeed undergone a revolution in just the manner I was describing, a re revolution that has had a profound effect on the way we live. It'll become apparent, I hope, as we reflect on the matter, what it might mean to recover then the more original sense of, of freedom and why it would be good to do so. Now, the fact that a revolution has taken place is not at all hard to see if we simply compare what we might call the normal conception of freedom in the contemporary world with the conception that one finds in the classical philosophical tradition. So we can take, for example, an observation from Aristotle it's interesting to note that the observation that I'm going to cite here in a second is one that he makes in passing. So it's a kind of illustration uh, to help clarify a difficult idea that he's attempting to explain. It's interesting because it suggests that he takes the observation regarding freedom to be perfectly obvious and not in need in any, of any clarification itself. <clears throat> 
So in one of the later books of his metaphysics, he writes the following. The, the free men in a household, the free men, have least license to act at random. But all things, or most things, are already ordained for them. While the slaves and the animals do little for the common good, and for the most part, live at random. So the contrast with our contemporary understanding could not be clear. What we typically associate with freedom, namely the capacity to do whatever we want without externally imposed restriction, Aristotle identifies with the condition of slavery. A free person for us is one, uh, sorry, a free person for Aristotle is one who cannot do anything he wants, one who has certain restrictions imposed on him. Along similar lines, Plato had referred to the free man as one whose activities are prescribed for him one after the other from sun up to sun down. The ancient, this ancient view of freedom is not just different from the modern uh, conventional view, it seems perfectly opposed. So what are we to make of this? How are we to understand uh, such a foreign way of thinking and what could it possibly mean for us? Scholars have long understood that one of the most basic reasons for the radical contrast between our notion of freedom and the concept that appears in classical philosophy is a semantic one. When they spoke of freedom, Plato and Aristotle were not thinking of a particular power of the human soul, more specifically a particular quality of the act of will, but instead of a social status. For them, freedom is not an anthropological term with personal significance. Instead, in the first place, it's a political term. So freedom for them meant membership, specifically membership in the political community of the city in which one lived. So a free man, and of course, as you all know, in ancient Greece, it was only the male uh, that could have this status. A free man is a citizen, one who belonged in an essential way to the city. By extension, with respect to the household, the free members are those related by blood to the father. The servants, by contrast, may contribute in indispensable ways to the running of the household. They may, in fact, enjoy a certain level of respect or deference because of their personal qualities, but they are not and can never be free. Freedom has here, in this ancient culture, a perfectly objective meaning. The foundation is membership, and specifically membership uh, based on blood kinship. If we think of freedom thus in terms of social status, the observations I just cited from Plato and Aristotle make more immediate sense. So why is it the free man, uh, why is it the free man in particular that has constraints placed on him that are lacking to the slave? Because the free man as the member of a community has a role to play, an office which carries certain powers and privileges of course, but these powers and privileges entail a complex set of duties and responsibilities. A non-citizen, a non-family member, by contrast, has no such office, and so the constraints placed on him are much more discreet and episodic. A slave may have a set of tasks he's compelled to, uh, to carry out, but as long as he reliably fulfills these tasks, he's otherwise quite literally on his own. He's a mere individual. There's no particular behavior that's expected of him, no special virtue that's generally awaited from him, nothing that is proper. Instead, as long as he has not caused trouble for others and gets done what he needs to get done, he can do, quote, whatever he wants. A striking contemporary illustration of the point being made here uh, is the popular TV series, The Crown, which my wife and I have just started watching. We're, we're kind of late with things. Um, uh, but if you're familiar with the, the program, as the series shows uh, quite relentlessly, the special uh, social status that Queen Elizabeth enjoys if enjoy is the right word, entails an extraordinary set of constraints. There are rules governing every choice that she's required to make, not just in political matters that affect others, but in what would have seemed to us to be purely private matters. What color and style of dress to wear on particular occasions, how to respond to family events, and so on. To use Plato's phrase, every activity is in some sense prescribed for her, from sun up to sun down. As the TV drama impresses on us over and over again, her office requires a kind of submersion of her individuality and personality. The whole of her existence, we might say, becomes an effort to rise up to the form that this freedom imposes on her. 
and service of the common good of which she is not only an essential part but the decisive representative. Now, it seems to me that we in the contemporary US generally find this idea strange and oppressive, or at least that's our most immediate reaction. Uh, but the fact that not only this series, The Crown, but perhaps even more uh, shows like Downton Abbey have been wildly popular with American audiences suggests that it's also fascinating for us, that something in us craves and indeed uh, laments the loss of the constraint and discipline of social form and the deep and very human drama it generates. However that may be, I want to defer to the end a reflection on that, that particular suggestion uh, and a consideration of what the ancient sense of freedom might still mean for us today. At this point, I'd like to now uh, shift gears and explore for a bit uh, what we have replaced this older sense of freedom with and what the implications of this shift are. So there are two ways to describe the modern revolution in the, in the conception of freedom. The first being the more immediately evident, but the second, I think, getting more at the essential uh, core of the change and what is at stake. So with respect to the ancient conception of freedom I just briefly described, we can say that on the one hand, uh, in the modern world, we, private, we have privatized freedom, and on the other hand, we have possibilized it. So let me begin with a brief comment on the more obvious change, the privatization of freedom. I'll explain both of these. <clears throat> in a classic essay called The Liberty of Ancients Compared with That of Moderns, which was a lecture delivered in 1819, the French political philosopher uh, Benjamin Constant felt compelled to point out that a lot of confusion had emerged in the 18th and 19th centuries because we moderns were using a word that the ancients had used, namely the word liberté, but perhaps without realizing it had infused the word with a radically different meaning, whereas the ancients had understood freedom to designate a public role with political bearing, as I've been explaining, Constant explained that in the modern world, we've come to associate freedom with what we, what we might call the private sphere. So for us, freedom means the license to pursue and enjoy more immediate pleasures, whatever strikes our fancy in a more personal sense. Freedom in this respect is precisely the disposal I have over the sphere of things that concern me and me alone, or perhaps my immediate family or, or immediate circle of friends. In other words, freedom is no longer a public office for us, but it has been reduced to pi uh, private sovereignty. My freedom is the sphere of exclusively personal matters over which I have complete dominion, a sphere that lies precisely outside of the matters of public concern. Now, accepting this description of our modern liberty that Constant offers, in contrast to the ancient sense, as a more or less accurate one, I think if we all reflect for a moment, that seems a fair description of how we tend to think of freedom. Um, it seems to me that there is a still more fundamental revolution in the meaning of the notion. Uh, one that lies behind the change that Constant describes, a revolution at the metaphysical level. So this revolution is far more radical and has uh, world-changing implications that have taken centuries to unfold. Some of the most potent fruits of this revolution have only directly come to light in the past decade, or even the past few years. I referred to this revolution a moment ago as the possibilizing of freedom. In more technical metaphysical terms, which I will explain, uh, we could describe it as a reversal of the classical priority of act over potency. Okay, that's a classical metaphysical principle, priority of act over potency. But because I do not take for granted that everyone here is a trained metaphysician in the classical tradition, I'll try to spell out in concrete terms uh, what this means and then reflect for a while on how this revolution shows up in the ways we typically think about freedom today. So um, these, the implications it makes, uh, it has are, are, are quite concrete and, and, and easy, easy to see, I think, once we, once we uh, point them out. So uh, <clears throat> in classical metaphysics, actuality means both uh, reality and completeness or perfection. When the classical thinkers affirmed that actuality is prior to potency, 
What they mean is that whenever we try to understand things, no matter what they are, we inevitably take our bearings from the notion of completeness or perfection. We can recognize what is incomplete by comparing it to what is complete. So when we seek to give an account of what something is, we define it according to its ideal form. We don't define a table, for example, as a wobbly structure with three good legs and a broken one, because that's what we happen to have at home. But we instead recognize our table at home as being in need of repair because we know what a table is meant to look like and how it is meant to function. Completeness is the reference point for incompleteness. This principle for the classical thinkers holds not only for artifacts, the things we make, but even more so for natural realities. For classical thinkers, events in nature are not purely random, but are always the expression of things seeking their proper fulfillment, trying to reach the completeness that corresponds to what they are by nature. The wood thrush sings its song to attract a mate. The uh, stickleback fish swims in schools to protect itself from enemies. Human beings also seek completeness, though of course the scope of possible failure and betrayal increases in tandem with the height of noble achievement possible. From the perspective of the classical priority of act over potency, then possibility acquires a particular character. It's always ordered to some perfection or completeness, or on the other hand, it's the fruit of some perfection or completeness which is to say that it exists for the sake of or as an expression of a kind of perfection. So lest that sound uh, a bit abstract, we can take uh, one of the more obvious examples to illustrate. So as a, as a fairly average human being, I have a potency for certain higher level activities like playing the piano. This possi possibility is given in my rational nature, whereas it's not given in non-rational natures, right? A cat will never play piano. The classical mind would recognize that if I've never sat at a piano, much less taken lessons, my capacity for this activity is very low. It is a possibility in the sense that nothing is preventing me from giving it a shot. But at the very early stage of training, it re represents uh, still a fairly unreal possibility. In technical language, we might say that my capacity for piano playing is an as yet indeterminate potency. To the classical mind, such a potency is uninteresting as long as it remains in this condition. It could be aimed in any number of directions, precisely because it has no shape of its own. We have here a purely open possibility. But this means from the classical perspective a rather impotent potency. If I were then to discipline my nature, by submitting to the constraints of perfection, the form that I'm seeking to acquire, my potency would gradually strengthen. It would become more and more real. More and more concrete possibilities would open up for me the better I became at actually playing piano. Now notice, this dis uh, development of my capacity in one respect entails a restriction or limitation of possibility in other respects. So the more I devote myself to acquiring the perfection of piano playing, the less likely it is I will ever become a superstar basketball player, for example. Uh, and one can think of many options that are eliminated by the, the time devoted. In another respect, however, my possibilities are liberated by this particular kind of restriction. So if generic abstract possibility is lessened, real rich and meaningful possibility is increased. In this classical world that privileges actuality, in this classical world, the world in which act has priority over potency, freedom becomes something that needs to be cultivated. Just as my freedom to play piano develops and deepens with my entering into the discipline of this art, my freedom more generally to be human and to do the things that belong to my humanity, to be a proper friend or a proper spouse, to perform my role in the family, to participate in my community, to love the world, to love God, requires growth and development. In this world, education comes to have a central significance. From the perspective of freedom classically understood, we think of education as the formation of the person with a view to determinate ideals of what a human being is meant to be. 
We foster a desire to live such ideals, an aspiration to become a full, flourishing man or woman. We encourage serious and deep attachments to people and to the real things that develop mature personality and liberate our humanity. We prize disciplined devotion to meaningful work and commitment to realities of intrinsic beauty and goodness. All of this represents a culture of freedom, at least if we take our bearing from actuality from completeness or perfection. It's not difficult to recognize that what I've just now described stands in contrast on many significant points to the notion of freedom that we tend to take more often for granted in the contemporary West. It seems to me fair to say that we, and by we I mean not just the average man in the street, but also our loftiest theoreticians and academicians, not to mention our journalists, our politicians, our lawyers and judges, our artists and culture makers, we, tend to identify freedom with power, potency, and possibility, rather than with perfection, completeness, actuality. Thus, freedom is typically for us, above all, the power to choose for ourselves, to decide what, whether we want to accept what is given, the capacity to change what is already there. It's the possibility of doing otherwise than we are actually doing. Freedom is not what is actually given, but lies with the capacity for novelty open possibility rather than completeness. We think we best protect freedom in this case by keeping our options open, by multiplying possible alternatives to some given path. I think all of this is sufficiently obvious not to require much elaboration in the present context, or if there's any difficulty in understanding this point, it's only because it's all too obvious. It's like the difficulty of the fish coming to see that it's in water. The connection between freedom and possibility seems so evident, so basic, we struggle to imagine what it could even mean to raise a question about it. But I'm suggesting that this association is the result of a radical revolution, which I described above as the possibilizing of our conception of freedom. So what I mean by this is that we've, re we've reversed the priority of act over potency, and we've come to rate possibility over reality to take open and indeterminate potentiality as the basic reference point for our understanding of things. As rational beings, we humans can't help but be guided in our thinking and doing at some level by some sense of perfection. But we have come to identify perfection, it seems to be, not with the reality of the actual, but most fundamentally with power and possibility. Lest this remain what some might call a mere academic concern, an abstraction far away from our concrete everyday experience, let's reflect uh, for a bit on some of the concrete implications of this reversal, this revolution in our basic way of thinking. I find it most helpful to juxtapose the classical and modern view of freedom in relation to a, a series of basic human realities to set into relief just what is at stake in this question. So first, what could be more basic than family? Our given relation to our mother and father, to our siblings, our aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents, down uh, into the mists of ancient history. As is often remarked, family are precisely relationships that we did not choose, but into which we're born in spite of anything we might want to say about the matter. If freedom is understood in terms of the primacy of actuality, we understand the very unshakable givenness of this relationship is a support that allows us to develop into who we were meant to be, a solid ground from which we grow in freedom. By contrast, if freedom is about open possibility above all else, then family cannot but appear as a threat to freedom. Friends, in this case, we say, are more important than family because we choose our friends. But notice, if we follow out this line of reasoning, to the extent that we commit ourselves to the friends we've chosen, the less free we are in relation to them. The relationship remains a free one only if I can leave it at any time. Of course, we recognize that's not a friendship. Along similar lines, we might consider the contrasting import of authority and law. As the Italian philosopher Augusto del Noce has so profoundly shown, authority and the law through which it comes to expression is an essential precondition for genuine freedom. Since it bears witness to order, it communicates form, 
which allows individual freedom to find an anchor and develop an inward viability and strength. Auctoritas comes ultimately from the verb augere, to increase or to make grow. The authority of parents is what allows children to grow into independent adults and so to enter into freedom themselves. By contrast, authority and law present an obstacle to freedom for the modern mind. One might accept in the modern context that a certain degree of authority and law is necessary. So one says that pure freedom would be total chaos. So we need some law. But notice to, even to suggest that your, your opposing law and freedom is two opposites that need to be balanced. Uh, it seems to me that we haven't yet uh, come to terms with the reality. Let's enter more deeply into human experience. There are two things that in, in inevitably bear on the exercise of our will that we associate with freedom in such a way as to guide that exercise and to that extent place a certain constraint on it, namely our reason on one hand and our desire on the other. But if we identify freedom with open possibility, with the unconstrained power to make our own choices, then both of these dimensions get marginalized in our sense of what it means to be free and so ultimately what it means to be human. This is especially evident perhaps with respect to reason. Reason bears a particular connection to actuality or reality. It's a receptive power, the essence of which is to recognize what is. Truth, the aim of reason has a certain objectivity about it, a necessity, even a universality. To the extent that reason, in this case, enters into our choices, we're thus uh, being guided by, being moved by, something outside of ourselves, namely reality. For the ancient mind, this is liberating. It is precisely truth that sets us free. The more compelling our reason for acting, the more free we feel and indeed are. For the modern mind, by contrast, truth cannot but appear as a kind of extrinsic imposition. We might need truth, but it comes at the cost of freedom. A, co a compelling truth is a threat then to freedom. Freedom inevitably turns into something irrational. Now, we might think that this means a modern man lets himself be ruled by his desires rather than by his reason. While this isn't absolutely false, it seems to me that the matter is much more complex. The deepest current of the modern sense of freedom is not just to silence our reason, but to silence our desire, or perhaps to obey desire only to the extent that we render it completely trivial and meaningless. In his wonderful book, God at the Ritz, Monsignor Albacetti spoke of our tragic reduction of desire. What does the impoverishment of our desire entail? In the ancient view of the world, desire is essentially reality tugging at our soul. It's ultimately rooted in goodness and beauty, and as such, it ought to be conceived as a, as a kind of an invitation to our freedom, a kind of unexpected invitation because desire acts on us, soliciting our attention before we are aware and can consciously respond. But it is just for this reason that desire poses a certain threat to the modern conception of freedom. As power, Modern freedom in this context is essentially a matter of control and thus resists being moved by anything other than itself. And so, because we cannot simply eliminate desire without becoming stagnant beings that perish under their own invincible inertia, we reconceive desire as something that's purely subjective and as far as possible, something that we have under our control. What we desire is from this perspective entirely up to us because it's not up to anyone else. The most radical form of this imputed sovereignty over desire is the theme that currently dominates the attention of our collective imagination, namely the natural desire for real bodily union with a man or woman, which has been transformed into the bizarre concept of sexual orientation, a concept previously unknown to the world, invented only recently in the contemporary West. This notion which ultimately changes the most original given meaning of our bodies into a choice, prompting the question of what our choosing ought to be based on, entails a radical schizophrenia, which is worth pondering, though we do not have the time to do it here.
but just think, just reflect for a moment. What happens when we make our very selves in our most intimate reality nothing more than the object of a possible choice? At the deepest level of the difference between the two conceptions of freedom we're considering lies the question of God and what the ancients called the good, the ultimate principle of reality that is the source of all goodness that we experience. What is goodness? The classical philosophers answered simply, that which we all desire. And by we, they meant not just we human beings, but all creatures whatsoever, every single thing in the cosmos. Reaching out into us through desire, goodness moves us before we move ourselves. And so that we can move ourselves. It sets the field of action for us. To call particular things good is to say that they make a claim on us. To be sure, there are many, infinitely many, good thing, uh, goods in the world. And so we have to make a choice in everything that we do. We have to select a particular good from all the rest and leave uh, the, the others behind. <clears throat> but for the classical mind, choice does not constitute our most basic relationship to what is good. Instead, choice always comes second. It's always responsive to a relationship already initiated, we might say, by what is good. Things look fundamentally different from the perspective of modern liberty. Here, things appear to us not most basically as goods, speaking to us, as it were, through our desire and reason, and enabling us thus to respond through choice, but instead originally as options. What's an option? It's something that moves me only because I let it. A mere option is wholly a function of my choice. It's the term of a relationship that I alone initiate through my act of will. There's a profound revolution in this transformation of goods into options, analogous to the Copernican revolution that Kant claimed for his own philosophy. Kant insisted that the human mind does not revolve around reality, but instead reality revolves around the human mind. In modern liberty, the revolution is even more radical because the human mind for Kant is at least compelled by reason the human will, detached from anything that would give it order and form, is compelled by nothing but itself, and whatever winds happen to be blowing through it at any given moment. In this open sea of possibility, even God becomes finally an option. This view of God arrives historically in stages. First, instead of a simple recognition of God's entry into history in the incarnation, as the son of man, an incarnation extended through space and time in the church as the body of Christ, we have a variety of apparently irreconcilable interpretations of that history, which imply a variety of interpretations of Christ and therefore ultimately a variety of in interpretations of the nature of God himself. Obviously, I'm speaking from a Christian perspective here, Catholic perspective. We've grown so accustomed to taking what we call religious pluralism for granted as an indisputable fact at rock bottom given that we're no longer astonished by this, as we might be if we were told that each individual person has his own solar system. We're no longer capable of seeing what is implied here and what is at stake. This is a possibilizing of God and therefore of everything else, as we'll see in a moment. The assertion of a fundamental religious pluralism gets radicalized historically beyond the political arrangement of cius regio eius religio, and then beyond the toleration for all Christian denominations within a nation, except for the Catholics. Locke was clear about that. And becomes in the most Western of Western civilization, finally a matter of personal preference. Relation to God is no longer something into which one is born as a member of a community, but becomes instead the result of a deliberate act of will, which we now identify as our most cherished freedom. So conceived, God, God, stands before us as nothing more than a possibility, which we actualize, which is to say that we make real, make effective, make genuinely meaningful, through our choice. God is the subject in the end to human power, which is another way of saying that human power as open indeterminate potency is supreme, the one and only absolute. Now, 
To say this would seem to aggrandize human freedom beyond all measure, but I want to suggest that the appearance turns out to be a deception. In reality, this absolutizing of human freedom turns out to be a radical trivializing of it. To make freedom in the first place a matter of potency, power, or possibility in the manner we've been describing is to separate it fundamentally from the real. So this is in a nutshell what I mean by freedom from reality. The things that make up reality, the concrete realities of our day-to-day -day lives, which define us, they give us our unique identity, they locate us at a particular time and place in history, they're all limited by their very nature. If we think of freedom as a stepping outside of these natural boundaries and therefore outside of the concrete realities that constitute our lives, so as to have power over them, to turn them into options, Freedom appears to cast aside all restrictions, and in this case, it presents itself as essentially unlimited. On one admittedly superficial level, this is no doubt exhilarating. One gets a thrill standing before apparently open horizons, but note, as we're coming to see in our reflections, the very thing that makes freedom unlimited makes it unreal. The promise of power invariably turns out to be an empty one. So an anecdote. After college, my brother and I shared an apartment, and my brother was working at the time for a small startup company, which was quite interesting and seemed to have some potential, but the founder of the company was not altogether honest. Like many small startups at their beginning, the company had some cash flow problems, which meant that at one point my brother went a couple of months without a paycheck in spite of the extra hours he was putting in. Since he and I were sharing the rent, this of course made me as nervous as he was, and I finally persuaded my brother to confront the boss and insist that he get paid or else he would be forced to find a different job. When my brother returned uh, from work uh, that evening, he was beaming with satisfaction, so I was relieved. I guess you got paid after all, I said. No, my brother answered. Then why do you look so happy? Because he gave me a raise. This was the boss's cheapest solution to the problem. And the irony is, the bigger the raise, the less likely it would be that my brother would ever see any money. The potential increased precisely at the cost of the reality. It seems to me that this rather diabolical irony lies at the heart of what we typically imagine the modern world to be. <clears throat> uh, the modern world of uh, freedom to be. So if we had more time, we could reflect on all sorts of examples. Um, like the many studies in psychology that reveal that the multiplication of options uh, tends to paralyze choice. But uh, we'll have to content ourselves with a basic instance, which I think carries a certain symbolic value. An opinion written for the 1992 Supreme Court case, uh, Casey versus Planned Parenthood, uh, Justice Kennedy rather infamously claimed that, quote, at the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence of meaning of the universe and of the mystery of human life. On the surface, this definition of freedom seems to grant us an extraordinary and unprecedented power. But the briefest reflection deflates this impression immediately. Unlimited pot potency turns out to be perfect unreality. If we all have freedom in the sense that Kennedy proposes, which is to say if we all have the power to determine the meaning of existence, then this can only mean that we cannot determine the meaning of existence in any objective or real sense that would bear on the lives of other people. We can only determine the meaning for ourselves. Or in other words, we can determine only our own subjective interpretations, our feelings about reality. But even this is not really true. If we determine the meaning of reality even just for ourselves in any definitive way, in a way that gives it an abiding significance, uh, then uh, we no longer have freedom. To be free, I have to be able to change the meaning of existence whenever I want, but this means that I cannot change it really in truth at all. Real change then can have no significance for me. Freedom is the power to determine the meaning of existence is in fact the total incapacity to determine the meaning of existence. This absolute power is no power at all. It's an unreal, empty illusion. In fact, an illusion that grows more unreal the more it is absolutized. This completely unreal freedom then puts up no resistance 
to the increasingly tyrannical imposition of rules and regulations that we've grown accustomed to in the contemporary world. In fact, it requires this imposition because as pure, empty power, freedom is nothing in itself and so can have only as much effective force in the public sphere as the government can devise for it. It's no surprise that in our culture we witness at the very same time the most extreme claims made on behalf of freedom and the most astonishing disregard or even contempt for its reality. It's no surprise because all this is logically implied in the revolution the notion of freedom underwent in the rise of the modern world. So what are we to do about this? What response is required of us? While a radical critique, a diagnosis that says the problem lies not just in this or that fact, this or that behavior, but in the very foundation of our thinking and doing, in the heart of our conception of man and so in our very being human, would seem to make things hopeless, it actually is a cause for hope in a deep sense. Why? We mount a retreat from reality, an attempt to protect ourselves in shells of delusion, but we can't but fail. Reality never retreats from us. As Charles Piggy has so beautifully shown us, hope is relentless. And this is because reality is relentless. The very self-undermining character of modern liberty, the self-aggrandizement that invariably proves to be a trivializing is therefore a, is a source of hope. Recognizing this triviality breaks the spell it otherwise might have on us. But it also entails a task, one that is not first a political program, though it has political implications, but one that is essentially concrete. It begins, as they say, in the home, which is where we all first encounter reality. The classical sense of freedom, as I've described it, roots freedom in the givenness of reality, which it recognizes as a gift, a reflection of the generosity of the creator, and so which invites us in, so to speak, through its beauty and goodness, the splendor of its truth. Whereas the modern conception of freedom would, would encourage us to protect ourselves from the claims of beauty, goodness, and truth, to en enhance our self-determining power by detaching most basically from the real, the classical sense would bring us to intensify our relationship to what is actually given to us in the world in which we find ourselves. The key to freedom from this perspective is not the abstract multiplication of options, but education. That is, the deepening of our receptive understanding and the formation of our love and our affections. Our free acts are best understood as the offspring, so to speak, of our love of the good. Plato long ago memorably described the purpose of love as begetting and giving birth in the beautiful. I want to suggest that what is begotten in beauty is precisely our freedom. Our acts are all the freer the more they spring from a passionate and comprehensive love of the good. And such a love remains available to us at any moment in history and in any culture. How fresh and genuinely spontaneous are the acts of people we might think of Monsignor Albacetti here. The acts of people in whom we recognize such a love compared to the stale tedium of the rational pursuit of self-interest that we take for granted as the standard engine of modern society. A society that is in fact governed by self-interest will be one that lacks the capacity to recognize genuine freedom and so ipso facto lacks the resources to foster and protect it, to enable it to flourish. The hope of freedom lies in communities that cultivate a love for beauty and goodness. Monsignor Albacetti, in whose honor we gather tonight, often spoke movingly of the human passion for freedom. This passion, this profound desire, will not be satisfied by, the, by multiplying options. What fills it instead is belonging, having our proper place in a genuine and generous order, being a member of a community that helps us to see what is real and discern the profound goodness that lies in it. A goodness that is truly for us, that will enable us to flourish in freedom, even in those places where left to our own devices as isolated individuals, as mere abstract choosers, we would only see hardship and suffering. This passion is finally most at home in the church, which is a city that, as again, Peggy observed, includes sinners as well as saints. It remains real 
and abides present no matter what illusions we may harbor and cast upon ourselves and others. This ultimate freedom is a blood kinship that exists at a more fundamental level than any possible failure because this blood that ties us together was shed on our behalf by the God-man who, as St. Paul said, came to set us free for freedom. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Schindler. A very bracing and uh, thought-provoking and eye-opening diagnosis and ultimately hopeful because reality, we can always hope in reality. I now have the privilege of inviting to the stage Father Jose Medina, the National Coordinator of Communion and Liberation in the US, who will pose a few questions to Dr. Schindler and moderate the Q&A session. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> I have a few questions, very simple questions. Uh, so, a matter of fact, to simplify even more the questions, I wanted to actually read to you a few of the things that you've written about that uh, I think it can help certainly me and all of us <clears throat> understand even deeper what you've been talking about. One quote that you have that I um, that relates very much to the first part of your talk is when you identify uh, liberty with morality. And uh, I think this is related to it and I would like to, for you to speak about this. You say that virtue with, um, let's say with a, with a Lockean sense of freedom is most basically self-control which means the power to determine oneself. And I was struck by this, by this sentence, that virtue is most basically self-control, which means the power to determine oneself and, and how you relate it to a Lockean sense of freedom, freedom as potency, as possibility. Because quite often, um, this is actually the, um, the definition of virtue that is most um, used even in religious uh, settings. So, can you speak a little bit to do, to this? Thank thank you. I, I, I appreciate that question very much. It's uh, th this is another instance of a word, um, the meaning of which has has changed really fundamentally, dramatically, and yet uh, because it's the the same word, we, we we tend to miss the the change. And so the the the, uh, the classical sense of what freedom is. Uh, sorry, what virtue is, and it's tied actually to the, the revolution and freedom that I was talking about. The classical sense of virtue is excellence. Uh, virtue is the capacity, in fact, to uh, pursue and to attain what is noble, what is good and, and beautiful, uh, to come back to those words. And so if you, if you think about that, um, virtue in that sense is, in, involves a being moved by some genuine good uh, or beautiful thing that, that draws the whole of me and, and, and includes the whole of me. And so, so this classical sense of virtue always involved the whole person. Um, in the modern sense, precisely uh, in tandem with this transformation of the meaning of freedom, um, virtue no longer means of being moved by the good, but has been reduced to self-control. So when, we, when Locke talks about virtue, that's exactly what he means. It's now the power that I have over myself. And uh, uh, what's, what's interesting about that is, um, uh, you see, it's, it's, uh, it has the same logic. It's, it's very interesting. I get into this in the book. It has the same logic that, that Max Weber sees in the accumulation of capital in, a, in a, uh, uh, money as, a, as an abstraction um, has a tendency to accumulate. In, in the modern morality, we have a tendency to um, uh, think of, of virtue as, as an accumulation of power that we have over ourselves. And, and uh, we, we simply assume that this is a Christian virtue. Um, 
but it's, it's so radically contrary to the, to the Christian spirit. Um, uh, in, to, to the, I mean, you know, it's, it's essentially, it's heretical, to mm -hmm. put it in, the, in classical terms, to the extent that I, my virtue is my control, my uh, self-control, um, I'm the object of my own, I'm in my own hands. And if I'm in my own hands, I'm not in the hands of God. Um, and it, it's important to, to pay attention to this, this shift in difference, this shift in meaning, because uh, the same word, as I said, has, has radically different meanings, but we'll have people that will point to the language of virtue in some of these early modern thinkers and, and present that as, as somehow defending this this old tradition, but it's, it, they're not defending the same thing. It really is, um, it's dangerous. And, 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 and uh, in fact, it serves to cut uh, at the core, at the roots, the, the, the tradition that was essential to freedom in the, in the, in the Christian tradition. You, 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 you thought about the same thing from the point of view of the word desire mm. also. Yes. Can you speak to that a little bit? You spoke a little bit in your, in your sure. talk. But, uh, no, th thank you. This is a topic I especially uh, am interested in. Um, uh, we take for granted in the modern world that desire is something selfish. Um, uh, uh, there's, um, and one can, one can point to that. Uh, to my mind, one of the best books that expresses that was a, was a profoundly influential book by uh, Anders Negrin called Agape and Eros, and he presented Eros desired as essentially selfish um, and, and proposed in contrast to that uh, an altruistic sense of agape. But, but the, the, the problem is um, uh, that th that's a complete misunderstanding of what desire is. And as I was explaining in the, in the, in the talk, we can think of a desire as, as, as reality sort of tugging at us. It's, it's, it's setting us in motion. Um, to be fully in motion, we have to cho we ha we have to involve our free choice, but but the 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 setting in motion is 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 something that react that that the good thing the the beautiful uh, 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 is is uh, is initiating, and in that respect, uh, desire is not self centered. I mean, it's essentially other centered because it's precisely the other moving me. Um, uh, one of the reasons that the, the ancient um, uh, philosophers were nervous about desire was not because it was selfish, but because they thought that it was we were th that reality was in a in a way taking too much control over us. And so the Stoic, we have a we have a we have a certain tradition of of detaching from all desires, but that that's not the Christian response. The tr the Christian response is to recognize desire as in the in the deepest sense. Uh, God's call. Why is it God's call? Because it's a, it's the, the 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 movements that that is initiated into us by the goodness and beauty of the world that He created, and so so it's 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 the, there can be a bad interpretation of desire. There can be a, a bad living of desire, but but in its very essence, we have to recognize it as a positive thing and as as part of our freedom. Is there a connection, uh, in your opinion, between an understanding of virtue as self-control and in religious circles and the loss of the word desire in religious circles at the same time? Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, perfectly. Because, because if, if to be virtuous means to be in control of yourself, and if desire is being moved by something outside of yourself, then they become opposites. And so it, it becomes the very essence of, of virtue in a way to silence desires, um, and that and that's and that's why you 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 uh, the, the the problem is that there's a certain conception of religion, a certain conception of God, that reinforces this movement. So we we think of God in a in an eschatological way. God is in the afterlife, and um, recognizing that. God in the afterlife will reward us for our virtue that helps us to detach from the desires that are involved in our everyday life. And so we, we come to use this, con this notion of God as a way of reinforcing power and a false conception of freedom. But we, we've, we've sort of baptized it with this, with this religious um, um, sanction.
And, and I think that's a, that's a very dangerous thing. And that's, that's, that's something that uh, uh, is, is very foreign to the classical Christian view of man. And what is the connection between desire and freedom? And you, you were mentioning before, you, it, it seems that you have a perception of desire of always positive even when you can lose your life or no, like your desire is always positive even though you can lose yourself. Yes. And what is that connection with desire and freedom then? Uh, that, there, there, there are a number of things we can say. Uh, um, desire is always positive in the sense that at its foundation, you won't have a desire unless there's something in you that's asking for what is good. So it's always good in that sense. Um, uh, 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 we, can, we can have desires that confuse us um, uh, uh, in, in all sorts of ways, but at its at its heart, it's it's a it's a it's a request for goodness and, and beauty. Um, uh, and in that sense, if we understand freedom, uh, as as I was arguing, uh, in terms of completeness and perfection, um, this this movement that is seeking uh, a completeness of oneself is actually a desire for freedom, you might say. Um, and that becomes especially clear if we also connect freedom with belonging, because by, through our desires, we're actually um, uh, taken up into an order of things that's larger than ourselves. And so um, uh, there's also that, that element of being part of a greater whole. In, in in your book, you speak about, I mean, you speak, uh, spoke about today also this Lockean sense of freedom, very related to potency, worried about uh, how to get power, how to act, ability, change. Right. Uh, and then you mentioned the, the sense of freedom of, that comes from the Greeks, mm -hmm. that is more in actuality, and is worried about, and you spoke a lot about belonging, what else is, is the, the, the freedom understood from the Greeks worried about? Or what are the words that you, you, would, you would use, like, if it is not power, then what? Uh, instead of power, it's, it's, it's perfection, it's goodness. And, and, and goodness is, is something that's simultaneously a satisfaction of desire, but it's also a task. You know, the more we receive the good, the more fruitful we become. And so that, that sort of energizes our, our generosity towards others, our movement towards others. Um, uh, so, so I would, it's, it's very interesting. Um, I'm, I'm, this book that you're referring to is volume one. It's meant to be followed. And so it ends with the Greeks. The, the one that I'm working on now is thinking of how the Christian context transforms the Greek, the Greek notion. And um, uh, one of the things that, that, that we see there is in the, in the late medieval period is, is precisely a transformation in our conception of God. So the inherited and then Christianly transformed notion of God as, as unstinting generosity, self-communicating goodness um, gets transformed into a God as understood principally as power, as omnipotence. Um, and uh, uh, it seems to me that that transformation that happens in, in nominalism, we're, we're familiar uh, with some of the figures there, William of Ockham and so forth, that that, that, that provides a perfect instance of this, of this opposition. Uh, so instead of self-communicative goodness, you get uh, power that imposes itself from without. You speak uh, may, may I add? Yeah. Self-communicative goodness, but notice what? How does how does goodness move us? It, it in a way it is it is imposing on us because it's presenting something to us that that we don't have yet. But it moves us precisely by enabling us to move ourselves. So it sort of reaches into us and moves us. And that's 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 I think a free relation, whereas uh, power. Uh, imposes from the outside, and 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 that is is uh, the the that provokes an attempt to become free in this false sense of of detachment. In this in this polarity between uh, potency and actuality, you also use two terms that you didn't mention today that I thought they are interesting: uh, the diabolical and the symbolical. Right. 
and I would love to hear uh, something. Yes, from. I wish we had a whole other evening for this one, but um, the, it's, it, it, uh, the, those are etymological opposites, the word uh, symbol and di diable. Symbol means in Greek, a joining together, a uniting, a, a, a bringing together, whereas diable means uh, a setting apart, a setting at odds. And um, it, it struck me that that, that, that was a, a, a captured in, a, in essence this revolution that I was attempting to describe. Um, it seems to me that the classical uh, cosmos ha had a, a deeply symbolical sense that we, that, that the things that we see in the world connect us, the things that move us by their goodness and beauty connect us to each other, they connect us to ourselves, they connect us to God, they, they insert us in the, in the political order and so forth. So, so there's a, an essentially unifying uh, uh, um, movement in, in the symbol in this. And of course, what's the classic, what's the paradigmatic symbol is the Eucharist, which is uh, that which you, you unifies us uh, when we all partake. Um, the diabolical then is, is, is the, the, the very things then that we associate with freedom, now rather than deeply uniting us to each other, these, these things precisely separate us. The very meaning of freedom is, is being separate from others so that I can have a certain control. And, and, and that is a diabolical movement. And the, the reason I like that, that notion of, of the diabolical, it also, I mean, what do we associate with, with the diabolical? We associate deception. Um, we associate a kind of uh, self-subversion. And I think all of these elements uh, enter into that conception of freedom when you begin to, to think through its implications. Um, so that's the beginning of a response. But. What I love very much about um, your talk and uh, the book is, is that I perceive that you have a sincere desire, and you speak about it in the book in particular, to, to reconnect modern freedom with its origin, with its root. There is a point in the, in the book that you say that response to cultural crisis must always first take the form of a, great, a grateful affirmation of what is given. And I think I'm curious about two things. So like, what is, what is the positive in the Lockean freedom? Uh, and how is this, you spoke a, a little bit at the end uh, uh, about this, but how is this, how are this, this modern sense of Lockean freedom, we can all recognize it in our lives personally. So how are we reconnected? How do we reconnect? I, I mean, that, that's, uh, when you start thinking through these problems, um, uh, your first reaction might be okay uh, to reject and to, and here's the irony, to separate yourself from this culture. And that's precisely the wrong move because it's again this, this movement of separation and, and trying to protect yourself by, by withdrawing. Um, uh, if, if in fact it is the case that our freedom uh, is uh, um, a, a response to what is given, we're given the modern world. This is the, give, the world in which we live. And uh, a, a, a simple reaction to it is not going to be adequate. So uh, we, we need first to be grateful about what we receive. Um, and in the Lockean sense of freedom, um, what, what, what do you have there? Um, I, I don't especially like the, the forms it takes in Locke, but I think you can find in, in other, uh, he's, he's, a, he's a bit of a slippery character, but there are other modern authors that, that show forth the, the genuine creativity. The, there is a sense of possibility that we have in the modern world that the ancients didn't have that, that's, that, that is, it, it's a precious thing. I mean, uh, it, it, if it, if it does bring a certain satisfaction and thrill to us to experience possibility, that's, got, that's responding to something that we desire. So there's, there's gotta be something positive there. Um, uh, the key is to uh, root these, po these modern developments back into the tradition rather than uh, 
interpreting them as a separation from the tradition, root them back in the tradition. So recognize the beauty of possibility, but recognize it as the fruit of our real relationships and uh, the fruit of our possession of the good. And, and that can liberate uh, a, a kind of creativity that, that goes far beyond, beyond what would, would have been uh, recognized in the classical tradition. So uh, uh, the great uh, German Catholic philosopher Robert Spemann um, said that the, the point is not to reject modernity, but to interpret modernity against itself. And what he means by that is that uh, the, the early modern thinkers, they precisely presented themselves as a break, as, as breaking with everything that they res received. That's very explicit in Descartes, for instance. Um, uh, and that we can't accept. There's nothing good about rejecting what we've received. Um, but, but it seems to me that we can, uh, we can uh, f see some of the fruits that came through these efforts that were always sort of better than the, the authors themselves understood and rediscover the roots because the, the, the tradition in a way is inescapable and that, that promises to bear much more fruit. So it's, it's, it's eff effectively, the first movement is a positive affirmative one. Mm. My favorite, uh, and this is my last question, my favorite, uh, piece of the book, precisely in this chapter six, that is the middle one between this study that you do of Locke and the Greeks, the potency and the actuality that you spoke about, mm -hmm. is um, when you say liberation is most basically a reawakening to a rootedness in reality, which you spoke a lot about today, so like what is unreal, what is real, uh, so that truthness, goodness, and beauty can become effective in us. And, and you say that coming to understand freedom uh, is not just a necessary condition for the effort to become free, yeah. but properly understood, it is already itself an essential act of freedom. Understanding freedom and being free are all but inseparable from one another. I, I, as I was listening to you speaking tonight, I think that the, the last part of your talk tonight was very much related to this. But even if it is not, I would love for you to actually comment on this, that understanding freedom and being free are all but inseparable from one another. Right, right. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot that's packed in Go ahead. little sentence. Yes, I, I um, uh, you know, one, one, one of the implications of the separation of reason and freedom that I, that I talked about in the talk um, is that we, we re reason then becomes something purely conceptual, intellectual, abstract, and then, and then freedom becomes something empty and indeterminate power. And um, when we start talking about these problems, uh, uh, problems in the culture, we tend to take for granted some form of that dualism that Monsignor Alvacetti protested against. There, there's, a, there's a dualism there. Um, and and uh, one of the expressions of that dualism is that we, we, we say, okay, um, understanding things fine, you know, let's, th 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 that, that has its place, but what we really need to do is act. We need to make a difference. We need to make a change. And you see that, that in a way, that's, that's precisely what, the crit that what I'm criticizing. That's the precisely the problem, this, this sense of, of freedom as acting, making a change. Um, understanding is, is a fundamentally receptive act. And um, uh, if, we, if we simply come to understand what the problem is, that's not just the first step. If we, a, a, a profound, a deep understanding of a problem is already a connection to the goodness precisely in the form of recognizing how it's being betrayed in some way. But that connecting to that goodness is itself, it's liberating. And I, and I, I mean, it, it's starting to sound a little mystical, and I, 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 but, but I think we all have that experience. Um, uh, uh, if we have, say we have personal problems, something that, some difficulty in our lives that we're trying to figure out, 
And uh, somebody, we, we speak to a friend and the friend will um, explain exactly, I know, I know why you're feeling this way, this is what's going on. And if, if what that friend says to us is true, uh, we experience it as liberating. Just, just hearing that pr proper interpretation that we didn't have the, and, and the, that clarification of what was confusing to us, we experience that as liberating. Why? Because um, it's an affirmation. We now understand, and, and in our understanding, we're receiving the, 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 the good in some way. Um, uh, and so it's not just a first step on the way to being free, but um, in a certain sense, it's the point. And that's why, if I may say, that's why philosophy is so important. <laughs> because philosophy is about becoming free. Um, it's not uh, just an abstract exercise of the mind. It's about becoming free. In a, in a sense, it's as if, just listening to you tonight, you, you speak in a way as if all of, you had a perception of reality, or you speak of a perception of the real things, people, circumstances, as with the capacity to actually communicate, attract, mm. fascinate, and that this is precisely this um, our incapacity to actually hear, just to use these words, reality is what is being missed right. in the modern world. Is that true or? Yes, right, right. And I think it's, it's because of uh, uh, where we are impoverishing what we mean by reason, we're impoverishing what we mean by desire, we've impoverished what we mean by freedom and what we mean by love. And, 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 and that's why um, the response is not a moralistic one, we need to try harder, we need to do certain things. The very first thing we need to do is, is come to a more profound understanding, re-enrich our understanding of what these fundamental human realities are. So then what, what conception of morality do you have? If morality is not self-control, is not to do according to a rule, and it has to do with desire, when, what is the conception that, that is born out of this? <clears throat> this might sound, sound uh, naive, um, but, but uh, this is basically what Plato, it's, what Plato implied, what Plotinus, the Greek philosopher, uh, said more or less explicitly, that virtue is nothing but falling in love with the good. I mean, in Christian terms, we, we could say it is uh, falling in love with God. And um, that seems uh, sort of sentimental, but that's because we tend to have a, a sentimental understanding of what love is. If we understand what that really means, um, uh, it includes everything that we would want to say about what virtue is. But the key is that virtue now is allowing um, God, uh, allowing the good to be effective in me, to bear fruit in me. Um, uh, uh, so that my that 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 my actions now um, carry a weight that is much greater than I individually could could give them. We have five minutes for two questions. There is a microphone there. If anyone wants to ask a question, if not, I would more than happy to thank him. We have somebody there. Thank you, David. My questions were unbeatable. Yes, <laughs> yes. And everything. Thank you very much for tonight. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>